A very good evening aspirants, I welcome you all to the Hindu daily news analysis brought to you by Shankar S Academy. Now before getting into discussion, I have an exciting announcement for you. The announcement is regarding prelims test series. Yes, Shankar S Academy is going to start pre-stroming batch 1 for UPSC prelims 2024. The orientation for the first test will be conducted on 11th September 2023 and the first test will be conducted on 18th September 2023. A total of 40 tests including CSAT and mock test will be provided in this test batch. The tests for batch 1 will be conducted only in offline mode and the venue for the test is Ananagar Chennai. Note that the GS test will be conducted on Monday and the CSAT will be conducted on Saturday. The fees details are also displayed here. Kindly register to the test series immediately and try to boost your prelim score. Thank you. Now with this exciting announcement, let us get into the daily Hindu news analysis. Displayed here is a list of news articles that we will be discussing today. You can go through it. At the end of the video, we will also have prelims practice question discussions. So try to watch the entire video. And a kind request to you all, those who haven't yet subscribed our YouTube channel, do subscribe and hit the bell icon button so that you will get regular notification about our current affairs videos. Now let's get into our first news article discussion. Take a look at this news article. Recently, the Tamil Nadu Elephant Conclave 2023 was held in Coimbatore. In that conclave, the Tamil Nadu government mentioned that the Elephant Corridor Committee of Tamil Nadu has conducted surveys all over Tamil Nadu. The committee have identified 42 elephant corridors. So the Tamil Nadu government has now decided to protect the identified elephant corridors. And this is all about the news. In our discussion today, we will understand about elephant corridors and also the importance of elephant corridors. First of all, what are elephant corridors? Elephant corridors are narrow, linear strips of land that connects two different elephant habitats. The elephant corridors are essential for the survival of elephants as it allows the elephant to move between two different areas in search of food and water. To say in other words, the elephant corridors are designated pathways or routes that allows elephants to move freely between two different areas without coming into conflict with humans. Okay. See, India has about 100 identified elephant corridors, which covers an area of over 1.5 million hectares. See, states like Orissa, Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh have the most elephant corridors in India. Okay. Now, why elephant corridors are important? As we all know, elephant is a large agrarian animal. That is, the elephants mostly feed on plants and trees. And it will also help in the dispersal of seeds. The average weight of adult elephant ranges to about 4 to 5 tons. Because of these facts, every day the elephant requires a large amount of fodder that comprises of various plant and tree species. That is, elephants need large areas of forest to obtain its fodder. See, the elephants usually graze an area on a rotational basis. For example, if the elephants graze on a particular area this month, it will again return to the same place for grazing after some months. The elephants will keep on moving to other places for their food. This helps to prevent overgrazing of an area and also prevents destruction of forests. As I said just now, the elephants keep on moving to other places in search of their food. Here, the elephant corridors play an important role. See, the elephant corridors connects two major grazing areas of the elephants. So, they can freely move to other places for grazing and the elephant corridors will also allow the elephants to get back to the same area for grazing. Okay? And this is how elephant corridors helps to conserve forests and elephant species. Now, moving on to see about the threats faced by the elephant corridors. See, the diversion of forest land for the infrastructure and energy requirements have slowly fragmented the elephant's natural spaces, including elephant corridors. Most of the natural spaces of elephants are now surrounded by human habitation, agricultural lands, mines, roads and railways. These activities eroded elephant corridors. So the elephants can't able to move from one habitat to another. This fuels the human-elephant conflict as the elephants move to agri land in search of their food. Okay, this is all about the threats to the elephant corridors. 
Now, what are the steps taken by the government to protect elephant habitats? See, to prevent human-elephant conflict and to protect the elephant habitats, in the financial year 1991-1992, the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change launched a centrally sponsored scheme called Project Elephant. This scheme provides financial and technical support to the wildlife management efforts by the states in protecting population of wild elephants. Okay, so Project Elephant is one scheme. In addition to this, the government is also taking some steps to protect elephant corridors. The steps include creating awareness about the importance of elephant corridors among local communities, then compensating farmers for crop damage caused by elephants and working with the forest department to manage human elephant conflict. See these steps of the Indian government helps in the protection of elephant corridors to some extent. Okay. In summary, it is clear that the elephant corridors are essential for the survival of elephants. Protecting these elephant corridors, we can ensure that elephants have a safe place to live and we will also able to avoid human elephant conflicts. Okay, and that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about what are elephant corridors, then about the importance of elephant corridors, then we saw about the threats faced by elephant corridors, and finally, we saw some points about the steps taken by Indian government to protect elephant habitats. See this topic is very much important for your both prelims and mains. So make note of each and every points that we discussed. Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this news article as we all know recently there was a military coup in Niger. See there is a recent development in this story. The day before yesterday ECHO was which is an West African regional bloc has ordered deployment of troops to restore constitutional order in Niger. See, ECOWAS would deploy 5,000 troops mainly from countries like Nigeria, Benin and Ivory Coast. And this is all about the news article. Now in this context, let us see important points about ECOWAS. First of all, know that ECOWAS is the short form for Economic Community of West African States. This regional group was established in 1975 through the Lagos Treaty. The headquarters of ECOWAS is situated in Abuja, which is in Nigeria. See, the ECOWAS was formed with various objectives. Now, let us see the objectives of ECOWAS one by one. Firstly, ECOWAS aims to economically integrate the member states by establishing a common market, then creating joint protection capabilities, then coordination in national economic policies, then liberalization of trade, adoption of common external tariff, and enabling free movement of persons, goods, services and capital. So through these actions, the ECOWAS aims to create a single large trading block through economic cooperation. This is the first objective. Then the second objective is that ECOWAS aims to promote the ideal of collective self-sufficiency for its member states. Thirdly, the ECOWAS aims to ensure economic stability in the region thereby raising the living standards of the people. And finally, the large aim of ECOWAS is to create a borderless region. And this borderless region would be governed in accordance with the principles of democracy, the rule of law and good governance. Okay, these are the objectives of ECOWAS. Now, why does ECOWAS aims to achieve political integration through economic integration? This is because the member countries of ECOWAS have a combined GDP of 734 billion US dollars. The member countries are also well endowed with natural resources. So by integrating the member countries economically and politically, the natural resources can be exploited efficiently and the full potential of the region can be unleashed. This in turn will help to increase the living standards of the people in the region. Okay. See, the ECOWAS is planning on achieving these aims by following a set of fundamental principles. Now we look at the fundamental principles of ECOWAS one by one. The first principle is that ensuring equality and interdependence among member states. Then the second principle is that securing collective self-reliance. Then the third principle is that making sure there is interstate cooperation between member states. Then the fourth principle is that giving guarantee there is no aggression between member states. And the final principle is that making certain that all disputes are peacefully resolved between the countries. Okay, 
these are the foundational principles of ECOWAS. With these principles, the ECOWAS is planning to achieve a variety of aims. Okay. Now coming to the member states, see the ECOWAS has 15 member states. They are Benin, Burkina Faso, Cabo Verde, Cote d'Ivory, the Gambia, Ghana, Guyana, Guyana Bissau, Liberia, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Senegal and Togo. But note that following the coups in recent years in Mali, Guyana and Burkina Faso, ECOWAS suspended the three members and refused to recognize their new governments. Okay. Now finally, before concluding our discussion, let us see the role played by ECOWAS in the West African region. Although the main aim of ECOWAS is economic integration and cooperation, ECOWAS has also attempted to quell military conflicts in the region. Since 1990, ECOWAS has been maintaining a regional peacekeeping force called the Economic Community of West African States Monitoring Group. The main aim of the monitoring group is to maintain peace and order in the region by deploying troops. For example, the troops were deployed in Liberia in 1990 during a deadly civil war. Okay. See now, ECOWAS is planning to intervene militarily in Niger to ensure peace. Okay. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the economic community of East African states, that is ECOWAS. Then we saw about the objectives of ECOWAS. Then we moved on to see about the principles of ECOWAS. Then we saw about the member countries of ECOWAS. And finally, we saw the role played by ECOWAS in the West African region. Okay. See, this topic is very much important for your prelims exam. So, make note of each and every points that we discussed. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now, take a look at this editorial article. This editorial article is written by former Raj Shabha MP, Mr. Subramanya Swami. Through this editorial, Mr. Swami highlights the present status of Indian economy, then about the issues with Indian economy, and finally the steps that can be taken to address the issues and to put India on a faster growth path. And this is the essence of the editorial. Now in this context, in our discussion today, we will see all the points mentioned by Mr. Swami in this editorial. Now before getting into discussion, the syllabus regarding this discussion is highlighted here you can go through it. Now let us start our discussion by looking at the status of Indian economy. Recently, the National Statistical Office released the GDP growth rate figures for the fourth quarter of the fiscal year 2022-23. In that, the GDP at constant prices in quarter 4 of 2022-23 is estimated at Rs. 43.62 lakh crore. Now if you look at the quarter 4 of 2021-22, the GDP at constant prices stood at Rs. 41.12 lakh crore. So, if we compare the quarter 4 of both fiscal years, there is a growth of about 6.1% in GDP at constant prices in 2022-23. Although the figures seem optimistic, if we dig deeper, the figures appear gloomy. See, in the year 2019-20, the GDP at constant prices was estimated to be 38.04 lakh crore. Compared to 2019-20, in quarter 4 GDP of 2022-23, there was a meager growth of only 14.5%. That is, for the past 3 years, the Indian economy had been growing at less than 5% annual growth rate. This is worrying trend for India as India is planning to become 5 trillion GDP by 2024. See, it was in 2019 our Prime Minister announced his dream of making India a 5 trillion dollar economy. In 2019, India's GDP was around 2.84 trillion US dollars. So, to turn India into a 5 trillion dollar economy in 5 years, that is in 2024, India's annual GDP growth rate must have been 15%. But as we saw just now, the annual GDP growth rate of India is less than 5%. So we can safely say that India will not become a 5 trillion dollar economy next financial year, that is in 2024. See not just from 2019, since 2015-16, although the Indian economy has been growing, the GDP growth rate has experienced a consistent annual decline. This decline has brought the growth rate down to a level that was earlier mockingly referred to as 
द हिंदू रेट ऑफ ग्रोथ सी द हिंदू रेट ऑफ ग्रोथ इज ए टर्म कॉइंड बाय इकोनॉमिस्ट्स टू डिस्क्राइब स्लगिश स्पेस ऑफ अराउंड 3.5 परसेंटेज इन जीडीपी ग्रोथ सी इंडिया विटनेस्ड सच ए लो लेवल ऑफ जीडीपी ग्रोथ रेट ड्यूरिंग द पीरियड बिटवीन 1950 एंड 1977 सी दिस पीरियड इज नोन फॉर स्टेट सोशलिज्म दिस कंपैरिजन रेजेस क्वेश्चंस अबाउट द इफेक्टिवनेस ऑफ द पॉलिसी मेजर्स इंट्रोड्यूस्ड इन रीसेंट इयर्स दैट इज इन द पास्ट 10 इयर्स ओके नो व्हाई इज द इंडियन इकॉनमी स्ट्रगल्स and what are the issues with the current economic policy that has put the indian economy in such a bad spot firstly there is no policy coherence according to the author the present government lacks structured economic policies and coherent implementation strategies this lack of clarity leads to uncertainty and hinders investors confidence so this is the main reason for declining economic growth in india secondly the author says that the present government has a trend of setting overly ambitious targets the author mainly criticizes the government's ambitious targets such as 5 trillion dollar economy by 2024 see unrealistic targets without a clear road map for achieving them is leading to eroding credibility of our country okay so these are the two issues highlighted by the author in the editorial then the other issues to the indian economy include structural bottlenecks like inadequate infrastructure complex regulations and bureaucratic hurdles then the next issue is lack of availability of credit due to high non performing assets and associated liquidity challenges in the banking sector then there is the issue of skill mismatch which is resulting in not being able to utilize the current demographic advantage that india is possessing lastly recent government policies like demonetization and the hasty implementation of gst have also severely strained india's msme sector okay these are some of the issues that the indian economy is presently facing in addition to highlighting the issues the author also provides some solutions to address the issues in this the author first says that the present government should look for solutions from india's economic history see during the tenures of prime ministers pv narasimha rao and manmohan singh that is spanning 1991 to 1996 and 2004 to 2014 the indian economy experienced notable growth over these 15 years the gdp growth rates ranged from 6 to 8 percentage annually despite some fluctuations the achievements of this period was mainly due to government policies that aimed to reduce state intervention and at the same time incentivizing investments these efforts led to a higher and faster growth of the indian economy so taking lessons from the past the india today can also reform the economy then to encourage economic activity the author suggests the abolition of income tax and scrapping of gst this will result in increased investment how when there is no income tax and gst people's disposable income will increase due to increased disposable income people will spend more and the demand in the economy will also increase see by looking at the increased demand the investor will start investing to meet the demand this will increase employment opportunities in the country so increased investment and employment will help increase india's gdp growth rate okay next the author also suggest measures to increase the purchasing power of india's middle class to increase the purchasing power the author proposes three solutions firstly to take up extensive public works and to provide employment secondly to increase the interest rate provided to fixed deposits to 9 percentage and thirdly to set a maximum interest rate of 6 percentage on loans given to the msme sector all these will help increase the purchasing power of middle class and this will also help to increase domestic demand then the author feels that the government must take steps to increase transparency and accountability ensuring transparency and accountability in policy implementation is essential for public trust in addition to this clear communication about economic policies targets and progress can help to build credibility this will result in an increase in investor confidence thereby bridging the savings investment gap then the author suggests formation of strong democratic institution to stop the monopolistic tendencies that is happening in india Finally the author suggests that India must take lessons from Russia. See after the collapse of 
the Soviet Union, Russia started deregulating its economy. Russia deregulated its economy rapidly without safety nets to the poor. This resulted in increasing economic inequality. It is due to such poor economic decisions, Russia is again back under dictatorship. So India must not make this same mistake. See, India must deregulate the economy and sell the loss making PSUs. But at the same time, India must take steps to increase employment opportunities, then to adopt affirmative action policies and to extend social security to the poor. Only this will create a level playing field in India and it will reduce income inequality. And this will also help India smoothly shift from state socialism to democratic capitalism. Okay. By following these suggestions, the author feels that Indian economy can again start its growth path and realize its full potential. Okay. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the current status of Indian economy, then about the issues faced by Indian economy. And finally, we saw some points about the steps that can be taken to speed up GDP growth rate in India. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this article. The news is that Karnataka government is trying to get lithium from South American countries to make electric vehicles and energy storage devices. This move is aimed at improving electric vehicle sector in Karnataka. Apart from this, the move will also give push to the renewable energy targets set by the Karnataka government. Okay, and this is all about the news. Now in this context, let us see some points about lithium, its distribution in the world and in India and then about the applications of lithium. Now first let us start with basics about lithium. See lithium is an element with the atomic symbol Li and the atomic number 3. Lithium belongs to alkali metal group. Note that alkali metals include other elements like hydrogen, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium and francium. See, lithium is currently extracted from two main sources. They were hard rock mines and salt flats. Here, salt flats refers to the dried lakes. Okay. Now, with this basic information, we'll see about the lithium resource in the world. See, the three South American countries such as Chile, Argentina and Bolivia together called as lithium triangle. This is because these three countries are having 60% of global lithium reserves. As we saw in the news, the Karnataka is going to import lithium from these three South American countries. Okay. In addition to these three South American countries, Australia, China, US are also having large lithium reserves and were leading producers of lithium. Okay. This is all about the distribution of lithium reserves in the world. Now let us see about the lithium distribution in India. See, India has found about 5.9 million tons of lithium reserves in the Riyasi district of Jammu and Kashmir. And this is the 7th largest deposit of lithium and it constitutes 5.7% of all the lithium reserves in the world. Also note that huge amounts of lithium deposits were also found in Mandya district which is present in southern Karnataka. Okay. So these are the two important regions in India that has lithium reserves. Apart from these two areas, the deposits of lithium are also present in Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh and in some northeastern states. Okay. Now we will move on to see about the applications of lithium. See lithium is used for variety of purposes. Now let us see the uses one by one. Firstly, lithium is used in manufacturing of batteries for cell phones, laptops and electric and hybrid vehicles. Secondly, lithium is added to glasses and ceramics for strength and resistance to temperature change. Thirdly, lithium is used in heat resistant greases and lubricants. Fourthly, lithium is alloyed with aluminium and copper to save weight in aircraft components. Fifthly, lithium is used in certain psychiatric medications and in dental ceramics. Sixthly, lithium is used as a means of storing hydrogen for use as a fuel. And finally, the lithium isotope namely 6Li was once used in the production of tritium for nuclear weapons. Okay, this is all about the applications of lithium. See, because of this widespread usage of lithium, the lithium is commonly called as white gold. See, currently India is fully import dependent when it comes to lithium. The demand for lithium is also expected to grow rapidly in the upcoming years. This is because 
the world is moving towards a cleaner energy future also india is set to achieve net zero emissions by 2070 so the lithium will play a major role in electric vehicle industry in india and it will also help india to achieve net zero emission targets by 2070 and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about lithium then about the distribution of lithium in the world and in india and finally we saw some points about the applications of lithium now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion take a look at this news article the news is that the national green tribunal in the eastern zone has told the odisha government to stop illegal construction near tampara lake See this Tampara Lake is important Ramsar site and it is one of the biggest freshwater lakes in Odisha. So the National Green Tribunal has ordered the Odisha government to protect this lake. Okay. This is the crux of the news article given here. Now in this context let us learn about National Green Tribunal from exam perspective. The National Green Tribunal was established in 2010 as per the National Green Tribunal Act 2010. as it was established under the parliamentary act it is a statutory body the national green tribunal is a specialized judicial body equipped with expertise solely for the purpose of adjudicating environmental cases in our country okay now what is the need for such a tribunal when supreme court and high courts are there as we all know most environmental cases in our country involves multidisciplinary issues so the issues will be better addressed if we have a specialized forum and considering this reason and also based on the recommendations of law commission on the obligations in the international laws the national green tribunal was established by the central government the national green tribunal is tasked with providing effective and expeditious remedy in cases relating to environmental protection conservation of forests and other natural resources additionally national green tribunal is also tasked with the enforcement of any legal right relating to environment and note that the national green tribunal is mandated to make the disposal of applications or appeals within 6 months of filing okay now coming to the composition of national green tribunal see the national green tribunal is headed by the chairperson apart from this the tribunal also consists of at least 10 but not more than 20 judicial members in addition to this the tribunal also consists of at least 10 but not more than 20 expert members so the national green tribunal consists of both judicial and expert members okay now let us see about the jurisdiction of the tribunal according to the national green tribunal act 2010 if a person is seeking relief for environmental damage involving subjects that are mentioned in the schedule 1 of the national green tribunal act then he or she may approach the national green tribunal see the laws covered in schedule 1 of the national green tribunal act are the water prevention and control of pollution act 1974 then the water prevention and control of pollution cess act 1977 then the forest conservation act 1980 the air prevention and control of pollution act 1981 the environment protection act 1986 then the public liability insurance act 1991 and the biological diversity act 2002 so if a person is seeking relief for environmental damage under these acts then he may approach the national green tribunal okay i know that the national green tribunal has jurisdiction over all civil cases involving a substantial question relating to environment additionally if any person is aggrieved by in order or direction of the appellate authorities under the legislation in schedule 1 then that aggrieved person can also challenge the orders before the national green tribunal okay now before concluding our discussion let us see the places of sitting of national green tribunal and its composition see the tribunal has its presence in five zones namely north central east south and west zones the principal bench is situated in north zone which is headquarter in delhi then the central zone is situated in bhopal then east zone in kolkata then south zone in chennai and west zone in pune okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion is saw about national green tribunal then about the need for national green tribunal then we saw about the composition of national green tribunal then we saw about jurisdiction of national green tribunal and finally we saw some points about the zones where the national green tribunal is present now with these points in mind let us move on to the next part of the video that is to discuss preliminary practice questions 
Now look at the first question. This is a pair based question. On one side, LF and corridors are given, and on the other side, the states where the LF and corridors belong to are given. We have to find how many of the pairs are correctly matched. Look at the first pair, Tirunelli corridor, Kerala. See this statement is correct. The Tirunelli elephant corridor is located in Kerala. Now coming to the second pair, Kaninpura Moyar corridor, Karnataka. See this pair is also correct. Kaninpura Moyar corridor belongs to Karnataka. Now coming to the third pair, Rivak corridor, Odisha. See this pair is incorrect because Rivak corridor is located in Meghalaya and not in Odisha. Now coming to the fourth pair, Chilla corridor, Jharkhand. See this pair is also incorrect because Chilla corridor is located in Uttarakhand and not in Jharkhand. Here only first and second pair are correctly matched. So the correct answer for the question is option B only two. Moving on, let's take up the second question. Look at the question here. This question is regarding National Green Tribunal. Here four statements are given. We have to find how many of the statements are correct. Look at the first statement. The NGT was established under Environment Protection Act 1980. See this statement is incorrect. As we saw in the discussion, the National Green Tribunal was established under National Green Tribunal Act 2010 and not under Environmental Protection Act 1980. So first statement is incorrect. Now coming to the second statement, the National Green Tribunal has original jurisdiction to hear environment related cases. See this statement is correct. The National Green Tribunal was established solely for the purpose to hear environment related cases. So second statement is correct. Now coming to the third statement, the NGT has power to award compensation for environmental damage. See this statement is correct. The NGT is empowered to award compensation to the concerned person for environmental damage. So third statement is correct. Now coming to the fourth statement, the NGT can only hear cases that are referred to it by the central government. See this statement is incorrect because the NGT can hear cases that are filed by individuals, NGOs or government agencies. And it is not necessary that the cases are to be referred by the central government. So fourth statement is incorrect. Here first and fourth statement is incorrect. Only second and third statements are correct. So the correct answer for the question is option B only two. Now moving on, let's take up the final question. Here six West African countries are given. We have to find how many of these countries are landlocked. Mali, Niger, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, Ghana, Liberia. Now look at this map here. Of these six countries, Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso are landlocked in West Africa. The rest three countries are open to the sea. So the correct answer for the question is option A only three. This is a quiz question for you today. I will post this quiz question in a community section. Try to answer it. And the answer for the quiz question will be posted in the comment section of the quiz question itself. You can verify the answers. And displayed here is a mains question for your practice. Go through the question, write your answer and post it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of the video. We found our video to be useful. Do like, comment and share it with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe to Shankaraya's Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.